some of the uh, upcoming events and field trips that we have scheduled right now. Uh, because we're maintaining um, compliance with the local guidelines for COVID-19 safety, uh, we are restricting the number of folks on each field trip to basically six folks plus the leader. Um, masks and social distancing are also required. Because we have a limited size and because we publicize our field trips in a variety of different platforms to give everyone an equal opportunity, whether you see it on NatureNet or on our website or in the newsletter, uh, we've gone to fixed times each week when new field trips are open. Uh, and if you go to our website or you go to the newsletter, which Megan published earlier today, uh, you'll see the detailed information about who the field trip leader is and how to get in touch with them to get on uh, to, to basically RSVP and, and to, to register for each of those field trips. So that's um, one, one good thing there. So um, other things that are new, um, as we talked about last month, but many of you weren't here, um, at this point, our Christmas bird count is on provisionally. Uh, December the 20th is our date. Uh, we are expecting to get some formal guidance from the National Audubon Society who oversees the, the overall Christmas bird count activity. Today, uh, they're telling individual chapters that we can use our discretion um, as far as the Christmas bird count. So we are on, uh, there'll be an update sometime after November the 15th to confirm that. Uh, clearly, if things change inside Boulder County, uh, there is the possibility that if we see another spike and local uh, regulations and guidelines change that that could still change at the very last minute, but we're planning for a December 20th Christmas bird count. We will not be having an in-person uh, compilation party after the, after the CBC itself. Uh, we'll probably have something like this, probably a Zoom platform where we can uh, share our results and have an opportunity to talk about the day. Um, but uh, we will not be having the potluck dinner in person. Um, for much the same reason, the holiday party, which is normally part of the November uh, event, will not be held in person. We will still be having uh, a Zoom presentation with Scott Rashid talking about kestrels. Uh, for our November program, but there will be no face-to-face -face holiday party held in, in 2020. I want to give everybody a heads up that Colorado Gives Day is coming up. That's December the 8th. Um, this is an opportunity for all of us to contribute to our uh, favorite local nonprofits. Uh, we hope that you consider giving to BCIS as part of your giving plans. Um, and the last thing I'd say is that although Colorado Gives Day is December the 8th, uh, you're able to donate throughout the, the year to Boulder County Audubon or any other nonprofit who's a participant in Colorado Gives. Then, then um, a little bit of just sort of some background stuff here. Um, the Board of Directors has been working on adopting uh, revisions to bylaws that were last updated in 2004. We completed that process. Uh, and uh, we unanimously adopted revisions at our last um, at our last meeting. The main focus here is to just get things up to up to current um, current best practices. Um, we have modified our election procedure somewhat. Members will elect directors, and then the elected board of directors will elect officers. Um, we have also made some significant revisions to our election procedures. Uh, as you guys know, during the course of the COVID, uh, we couldn't meet in person, so we had to go to alternative voting procedures. Um, our old bylaws didn't allow online voting, which was a requirement, so we weren't in strict compliance with that. So we've revised our bylaws to ensure that we can remain compliant um, in the case that we need to continue to do online voting in the past. And we're working on trying to make sure that Boulder County Audubon is doing everything we can to, to be best in class in terms of our approach to governing ourselves as a nonprofit. And so we've one of the steps there is that we've uh, established a, a standing governance committee, which will be involved in 
uh, managing the nomination and election process for directors, uh, but we'll also be working on developing uh, policies and, and procedures that we think will put us uh, on par with the best practices for nonprofits here in Colorado as we, as we go forward. Okay. All right. Um, now I'm going to um, introduce for you a I have a few minutes here to um, talk through this. Uh, Steve Jones, who's um, been working with our Teen Naturals program for quite some time, um, has uh, put together with the help of the Teen Naturalists and the parents who help um, a slideshow that shows a lot of the great photography work that they've done in the field over the course of the last year and gives you a little bit of a glimpse into um, some of the field work and the projects they've been working on. And hopefully I'm gonna be able to get this started here. Give me just one second. And so this will play for about five minutes. Hang, hang on a second. Let me back up. I'm not at the front here. Okay, so this will play for about five minutes. Um, there's no, audio, there's some music that will play, and then we'll roll the credits, and then we'll move to the next phase of the program. You need to share your screen. Okay, sorry. to do. I don't do anything. It's fine. Unusual butterfly. Mm -hmm.
Yes, it's so white. Okay, I hope everybody enjoyed that. I certainly did. I want to thank all of the teen naturalists who've contributed their, their photographic work. Uh, I want to thank Steve for all the hard work he does in organizing that, the parents who support the kids and Steve and the other members of our uh, membership who help on field trips and various other activities. So thanks very much. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol Campert who will introduce our speaker this evening. I guess I'm here. Okay. Um, I don't think I need to introduce Dave Leatherman to many of you. You probably know him from his many articles on birds the, that he writes the column for the hungry bird and gives us all insight into how birds and insects are so interdependent. And that if you, what I always remember on field trips with Dave, where I've gotten to know him, is that if you see that looks in distress like holes and black and funny things on, then that's a good sign because that means it's there's food there for the birds. So um, I've gotten a lot of insight into what to look for for bird food, and one places is along. Um, fences in the Pawnee grasslands and other places, barbed wire fences where logger, loggermen's shrikes have, um, logged, I should say, loggerhead shrikes have uh, impaled their prey. So now every time I see a uh, barbed wire fence, I look for lizard heads and, in, and beetles and everything else that those shrikes are saving or using that female loggerhead shrikes. Fun getting to know him. So thanks Dave for coming down for Fort Collins. He's an Ohio State graduate, grew up in Ohio and uh, 
a BF, BS degree in, at Marietta College and in forestry. And then, a, um, or excuse me, in biology, and then a master's in forestry from Duke University in North Carolina. And uh, he's a retired entomologist. He, was, he worked for the Colorado State Forest Service for 32 years. And he writes journal Colorado Birds and reports to, uh, to co-birds from the Grandview Cemetery. I'm sure you've seen his reports on all the wonderful stuff that goes on in the Grandview Cemetery in Fort Collins. I love to see his reports on co-birds. And you find out all kinds of things about those psyllid, in those psyllids birds like to eat, which I never knew about before. It's really fascinating. And um, so I'm, at that, with this, I'm just going to say, uh, thank you for coming and welcome and for sharing all of your knowledge and enthusiasm about birds and insects. And tonight, spiders, arachnids, and their webs. This is a little deviation from his usual bird insects. And I'm really looking forward to that, to seeing, hearing more about my favorite animal. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Am I through? Dave, you have to unmute yourself. Look at the bottom left of your screen. Do you see that where there's the microphone? and click on it because you're still muted. You can, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, no, I'm not sure what I got to do here. Um, I don't see the share yeah, screen no, thing you anymore. Let me do it. It's easier for me to do it than to try to tell you what to do. <laughs> uh. Okay, we want to. Uh, uh, where is this? If you put your cursor at the bottom of the screen on that black bar, this share screen will come up. I don't see it. You may have to just wiggle your mouse over the over the screen where it has either all of the all of us as images or elsewhere and the bottom there's a share screen button. We don't see share screen, that's the problem. Um, it's you, have right a, you have a have a black bar at the bottom of your screen. To the right of participants, there's chat, then share screen. Well, unfortunately, we're on the. Um, Is there a black bar on the bottom of your screen? Uh uh. Anyway, we're we're on the presentation. We're trying to let me. So you, when you're uh, Carol, when you're on the. Um, the, you need to be on the Zoom window, not the present I'm trying to be, but here we go, share. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I don't know what's happened. Um, sorry, we had this. I don't know, there's a Zoom, okay. The Zoom thing has kind of gone away. We've got the presentation up, but I don't know how to get it. <sighs> so what are you currently seeing on the screen? Well, I see his presentation, but um, I don't know where to how to. Somebody had suggested trying alternate alt S. Do you want to try that, Carol? There we go. Okay, thanks, Karen. 
You are screen sharing. Stop share. Yeah. That looks perfect. And just start the presentation from the beginning and okay. we'll, we'll be good to go. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Can everybody loud and, hear? Clear. Loud and clear? Yes. Okay. So uh, sorry about this. Uh, I guess my first admission is that I'm a 71 year old virgin. And so I'm asking you to be gentle. Uh, this is the first Zoom thing I've ever done, obviously. And I'm at somebody else's computer. Um, I'm not a spider expert. Uh, hopefully I'm beyond knowing enough to be dangerous. But got the worst uh, sets of eyes. I, I'm, I'm not going to say I, I won't be misleading or that I can answer all your questions, but um, uh, being interested in what birds eat, um, I see them eat spiders, and so I wanted to know more about spiders, and I've gotten interested in spiders, and then I have a my girlfriend, Janiel Thompson, in Lamar, Colorado, is a photography buff and she got interested in photographing spiders and the idea for this talk kind of came about that i wanted to show off her photography and so that's what hopefully we're going to do a lot of that picture on the first slide is hers and we've had a lot of um interesting time on taking spiders out of the refrigerator onto her kitchen counter and uh, having sessions. My job is to make them smile and she takes their picture. So um, I think we'll move to the next, let's see here. So uh, uh, the background for my screen, which my face, which Carol picked out is, uh, she had that picked out before I got here, but I think it's kind of neat in terms of uh, spooky Halloween spider talk. So it, it looks kind of good. And uh, I'm amazed at uh, how much I look like a certain politician. So if a, pol a fly lands on my head, it's not me. Um, Anyway, uh, so there's a lot of questions that come up regarding spiders and anybody who's been at the end of a telephone as um, an entomologist, you get a lot of spider questions because uh, everybody thinks spiders are insects. And uh, a lot of these questions, you should be able to answer when we get to the end and I'm not going to go through all these, but they're all questions that uh, come up a lot. Um, so let's get through the taxonomy of a spider off the bat here so that we kind of have the, the setting. Um, that thing at the bottom, K-P-C-O-F-G-S, uh, I learned it a different way in college, but if you can remember, King Philip came over for good soup. The first letter in each one of those words is the order of these various taxonomic breakdowns, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and you could substitute a lot of things for the S at the end, uh, sandpiper, sex, whatever you want to put there. But um, so we're in the animal kingdom. Uh, the phylum Arthropoda, arthropods are the joint legged animals. Uh, class Arachnida, spiders and relatives. The order Araneae, spiders. So here are the 
five subphyla. So this is a category kind of between phylum and class um, of, of the arthropods. Uh, trilobites, which we all know what they are and that they're extinct. And then the chelicerates, and I found out from my buddies at CSU that I've been pronouncing this word wrong my whole career. It's not chelicerates, it's chelicerates. Uh, chelicerates uh, involve some extinct sea spiders, and you can see some great uh, fossils down at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And then the arachnids, the spiders. Uh, next one is the myriapods or the many-legged uh, animals, centipedes, millipedes, and a couple other obscure groups. And then crustaceans, crabs, shrimp, roly-polies, uh, tadpole shrimp up here, and um, the scuds or fairy shrimp. And then hexapods, which are the six-legged uh, creatures, the insects. And there's a couple groups that I learned as being insects, columbula, proturans, and diplurans, which are now separate from, they're not considered insects anymore. But um, I've long thought that the um, taxonomists are in cahoots with book people so that we have to keep buying new books. Um, so here are the arachnida and the groups, uh, the many groups of them. Uh, the spiders are the best known arachnids. And we have scorpions, which are not really insects related. Mites, ticks, uh, daddy long legs or opionids. Uh, the solifuges, which have a lot of different names, but most people call them sun spiders. Uh, horseshoe crabs, if you are from the Atlantic coast, you've seen horseshoe crabs and know that they're some kind of special creature, whatever that is. <laughs> and miscellaneous others like the uh, little pseudoscorpions that you find under the bark of trees. So I want to get uh, daddy long legs and these giant camel spiders out of the way uh, first. Uh, so daddy long legs are not really spiders. They're uh, in a separate group, these opilionids. And I saw this situation in this picture at the cemetery where I go all the time. And I thought this has got to be not good for one of the two. And um, actually figured out later and looking online and studying up a little bit that these are, that's actually their mating. Um, I don't know, it looks pretty violent, but uh, suffice it to say they're into it. Um, <laughs> uh, they have a lot of different names. Harvestmen is another name for it. They are not poisonous, and a lot of urban legends exist about daddy long legs being the most poisonous creature out there and that they can bite you, and um, they have no venom, no fangs, and they cannot break the skin. So they're perfectly harmless to us. Uh, most of them are scavengers. And um, part of the confusion comes from the fact there are some spiders that also have the common name of daddy long legs. And as all of us naturalists know, uh, sooner or later you figure out that common names can kind of be dangerous because somebody's common name uh, for something is somebody else's common name for a different creature. and Thank goodness for scientific names where you can only have one genus and one species for each organism. Um, I wanted to dispel this notion that there are giant camel spiders or solifuges or sun spiders, whatever you want to call these in Iraq. And this picture was prominent during the first Iraq war on the internet and was the beginning of the end as far as the truth being told on the internet as far as I'm concerned and uh, this is simply a cam camera angle that makes these things look gigantic and they are not they're small they're maybe an inch long and you've probably seen them uh, in Colorado they're not 
super uncommon. And uh, Dr. Paula Cushing down at our Denver Museum of Nature and Science is probably the uh, best person for this group in the North America. And she's trying to work out the taxonomy. And um, I'm, I'm glad she is because they're very interesting creatures. So here's, here's this big group of uh, arachnids again. You don't see any insects on there. Insects and spiders are not related. Spiders are not insects. Um, mites and ticks and daddy long legs are not spiders. Spiders are a separate group. So the word arachnid is uh, from Greek mythology. And arachne was a, a mortal human who uh, was bold enough to get into a contest with Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and crafts. And then her uh, other mistake was that she outdid Athena in this weaving contest, which got her, according to legend, Greek mythology, bopped on the head three times with a spindle she tried to commit suicide, but uh, was brought back to life by um, Minerva or Athena and uh, assigned to weaving for the rest of her life. And uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, and spider comes from the Anglo-Saxon word spin on, which means one who spins. So here's Minerva chasing Arachne in this uh, famous painting. Um, gonna bop her on the head with the spindle for beating her in the contest. And it kind of reminds me of uh, some stuff that's going on these days when you certain people outdo other people. That, that's, the, that's the reaction we're getting. And I don't know, it's crazy. Um, I need to go back. How do I go back? Um, so here are features of spiders. Uh, they have eight legs, as we all know. I talked to preschool kids, and now they know spiders have eight legs. Um, and these kids are very smart at a very young age nowadays. I, I worry about the social stuff, but they got their facts down better than I sure did when I was four. Um, eight eyes, except for a couple families have six. And uh, if you get into spiders and you want to try to figure them out, of course, the first um, the first job is to decide, is that really a spider? And once you figure out it is a spider, looking at their eye arrangement, the pattern of the eyes is a very important starting clue. And pretty much each family has a different arrangement of these eight eyes. So um, you got to stare them in the face to start figuring them out. And that may be hard for some of us to overcome. But I assume if you're getting into spiders, uh, you're past that point. Um, they have two body regions, unlike insects, which have three. Um, Calissary are the mouth parts. And they have these uh, kind of a, a set of what looks like very short fifth set of legs up around the mouth, which are the pedipalps. Uh, the calissary are in two parts. Uh, the pateron is what we see for the most part. And then inside of that and coming out when they really need to use them are the fangs. So think of the pateron as like a holster and the fangs are the, the taking the knife out of the the holster or out of the sheath. And um, a lot of times when we see a little jumping spider and it's staring at us and we see those bright green, we're calling them fangs. And really that's not the fangs. Uh, that's the pattern that we're seeing. And the fangs are up in there and, and usually black. Um, most, all spiders are terrestrial. There aren't any uh, sea going or saltwater spiders. Um, none that live underwater. They have no antennae or wings. They're carnivorous. Uh, silk is their special 
feature that they extrude through these uh, organs called uh, spinnerets. And then they have a lot of hair and uh, some sensory organs that are usually in the form of a slit. So the spiders are air breathing. They have a, a elaborate system of trachea, a little hollow uh, cavities throughout the body. Uh, some spiders have a different arrangement where they kind of fold in part of the outside uh, of the body and that, that becomes uh, uh, full of little tubes for uh, oxygenating uh, exchange that way. Um, they don't have muscles attached to their legs. It's all uh, hydraulic pressure. And uh, when, when you see a spider capture an insect, it's not uh, gulping it down like a bird would do. It's chopping it up into little fine parts and then it uh, swallows those or even dissolves them uh, right out at the mouth. Uh, the the long, longest lived ones are tarantulas, which some of them have been well over 30 years. Uh, by the numbers, uh, I guess birders can relate to this 800 species in Colorado. We have 500, uh, 500 plus birds now in Colorado. So spiders are a little bit more numerous than birds, but I guarantee you uh, most of us have never seen more than uh, 50 probably, but um, that's because uh, most spiders are very, very small. Most spiders are in the duff down in the leaf litter. And um, to really see spiders, you've got to get down and sift through leaf litter and really uh, use magnification to see the great, great majority of them. Um, so I don't, I don't know who the person was that sat in there office and figured this out, but 25 million tons of spiders are thought to eat about 400 to 800 million tons of insects a year in the world. Uh, I mean, that's sort of like Ted Floyd saying he, he saw a pterodactyl at three in the morning, who's going to prove him wrong? But um, uh, I, I don't know how this calculation was come up with, but uh, sounds good. Uh, and I would say that uh, over the years, I've tried to figure out how soon do I have to get the kids before they're not afraid of insects. And I kind of gave up at preschool. Uh, kids are already hate them or love them by the time they're four. But I think there is a period when we are taught or we have an experience that makes us fear insects. Spiders and snakes, on the other hand, I'm almost beginning to think that those, that's an instinctive thing. The way snakes move and the way spiders move, I think that's, that's maybe something we're born with and we have to learn otherwise. So, but it goes both ways. Um, Spiders are just as afraid of us as we are them. Um, thank goodness for the far side. I wish that thing was still going. Gary Larson, don't go away. Um, spiders can be very, very small. And this is a little jumping spider, an immature jumping spider. But there are adult spiders that are even smaller than this one, uh, po poised on a dime here. And this is one of Tennille's pictures. Um, pretty cool picture. So here's the body parts of a spider. And if you remember, we said they have two main body parts, the, the head and the thorax in a spider are combined into one big part called the cephalothorax. And then we have the abdomen to which uh, the legs are all attached to the cephalothorax, just like the legs are attached to the thorax of an insect. And you can see, um, so these are the two main body regions, cephalothorax and body. The head is part of this big front region. And then uh, the legs are kind of uh, broken down the way we define insect legs. These are the pedipalps, which are not legs. They are 
uh, basically alternative, their mouth parts or accessory mouth parts. And then the chalicery are up in the very front and we'll see some good pictures of those. But the real action on a spider are the spinnerets at the back end of the abdomen. So silk is a pretty amazing stuff. And uh, the more you read about silk, the more amazing it is. Humans have long wanted to figure out how to make this stuff, how to copy it, how to use it, how to use it for our own purposes. And we still haven't done very well at that. Um, silk is, uh, like all proteins, it's made up of uh, amino acids. And if you think of these amino acids as being uh, molecules that are kind of arranged like a log deck in a river, and then we squeeze that log deck out this little um, opening, like a, if you're decorating a cake with uh, icing and you're squeezing it through a little uh, opening. Uh, the extrusion process is really, uh, other than silk itself, the extrusion process is probably the spider's biggest trick because uh, that's what allows it to be a even diameter uh amazingly precise uh, like it was you know designed by a, an engineer it, it comes out this perfect diameter and uh, the, ex the extrusion process is what does that um, the silk once extruded is both flexible and strong and uh, amazingly so um, like I said, they, their secret is this extrusion. And silk, uh, depending on what kind it is, and it can be produced from different glands, it, it can be very fine, it can be sticky, it can be not sticky, uh, fuzzy, and so on. And all those different kinds of silk have different uses. Uh, the spider's got to walk across its own web. So uh, it has to know where the unsticky silk is and uh, an insect that's slamming into a web doesn't know. And eventually if it flops around, it's gonna get into the sticky part. So so here's Stan, the spider got stuck in his own web and he obviously forgot where to walk. Um, the uses of silk are many. Trapping prey, you know, catching things to eat is what we think of first, but little tiny spiders will spin out a long strand of silk behind them and uh, they're so lightweight and the silk gets to a length where it becomes uh, trapped by the wind and pulls the spider along with it and the spiders go through the air sometimes for many miles uh, through this process we call ballooning and so silk can be used for getting from point A to point B through the air by capturing the power of the wind. Uh, they can lay a silk down and just follow that as a like a trail. Uh, so they on the ground on a terrestrial site, they can just lay down silk and use that as a way to get across something. Um, female silk has pheromone in it. So it smells like a female and the males will follow that pheromone laden silk to find her for the purpose of mating. Uh, of course, they they use silk to cover themselves up and to cover their eggs up uh, to shelter them from predators and from the weather. So here we see Stan, or Bill the spider, this time it's Bill, and uh, he's trying to catch flies and he's got his fly decoys out there and his web is set and uh, luck is in the air. So here's a drawing that my son did for a book by my buddy Whitney Crenshaw that shows a little spider emitting a long strand and it keeps coming out and keeps coming out and finally it gets to a length that's 
long enough, uh, the spider doesn't do this unless it's uh, adequate, adequately windy. They point their abdomen up in the air and begin releasing the silk and eventually it's lengthy enough that it catches the wind and off they go. So they can, they can disperse by this ballooning. They can of course walk and then a lot of spiders uh, hide in our uh, hay bales and our equipment that we lawn furniture that we move from Massachusetts to Colorado and uh, hitchhike on our uh, objects on our accumulated bounty. So you've probably uh, seen a spider web, a good orb weaver web, and seen this funny little zigzaggy. Uh, part of it and wondered what is that so the million dollar word or ten thousand dollar word i think that's too many letters for scrabble but it might impress somebody at the bar if we're ever allowed to go back to bars but uh that's called a stable momentum and it's thought that they put that in the web to make the web more easily seen by birds so they don't slam into it and ruin it but uh, by doing so, they um, also reduce their catch by 30% or so because insects see that thing too and don't go flying into the web. So there's a trade-off. Um, I guess I'd rather have 70% of my insects flying into this than one bird. Um, so Spiders are obviously part of food webs. Uh, not to, it's not a pun. Uh, um, a food web is a good name for uh, the whole chain of things that eat each other from big to little. But um, spiders are, are major. We just don't see uh, other things eating them that often. And you have to really want to see it to see it, but um, they think some habitats might even have 100,000 spiders per acre, then the acre is like a football field. So they are super abundant. And if you're afraid of spiders, then I guess, I don't know where to tell you to go because they're in their house too. Um, uh, most spiders, like we said, are very small. They mostly eat insects and mites. Uh, some spiders specialize in other spiders. Some even eat fish. Um, webs uh, sometimes capture birds, and I'm not sure how many spiders actually partake of the bird. I think that's mostly accidental, and the spider probably moves and builds another web. Um, but spiders are food for a lot of things, and so I just put this little wheel together showing all these different creatures that love to eat spiders all eyeing this poor little spider in the middle um, this is a an amazing tiger salamander that my grandson trey caught on his playground in denver and he took it home for a pet and fed that thing crickets and this thing grew into a monster and so that's trey's happy tiger salamander um, but this one group of spiders the pompilids pompilidae uh, they they strictly provision their nests with spiders and this blue and orange one is the tarantula hawk that is probably the biggest wasp in Colorado no doubt and if you've ever been in southeastern Colorado when these things are flying around uh, you probably uh, are less than relaxed when you see one of these things flying toward you they're giant I mean they're you know three four inches across the wingspan and they are uh, their spider of choice is the tarantula so they got to be big and i've yet to see a, a tarantula hawk and a tarantula have a duel out on the prairie but i'd love to see that sometime i think that happens mostly at night um, 
but I think I want to see that. That's on my bucket list. These uh, a lot of these spiders that we call mud daubers provision those mud cells that you see on the side of your house or on a bridge abutment or whatever with spiders and a lot of spider surveys rely on uh, finding those mud dauber west uh, cells and breaking that mud apart and, and letting the spiders do the sampling for them you can find out a lot about what spiders are in the area by looking at those it's kind of a mean trick but somebody's got to do it um i gotta brag about this little spider because this is the one spider that or the one wasp that I have found that was new to the planet. Um, uh, it gets really hot in Lamar. And one day I was down there uh, visiting Janelle and I went to the Lamar Community College Woods and it was, I don't know, 100 plus. And I had to get out of the sun. So I got on the shady side of a cottonwood trunk there by the tennis courts at the Community College. And I'm watching the action uh, ants going up and down the bark and one of the ants jumped across a crack and i said to myself spiders can't do that or ants can't do that and i caught it and lo and behold it had wings and it was a little pompilid a little spider wasp that was mimicking the ants it's a very good mimic of the ants and in real life, when this thing is running up the bark, mixed in with the ants that are moving up, uh, you can't see the wings unless you get the right glisten from the sun. But otherwise, you know, it, it looks just like an ant. It moves like an ant, except for this flying across a, a, a canyon of, of bark. And uh, anyway, Dr. Evans at CSU, Howard Evans, the famous wasp expert uh, decided this was a new species and he named it Dipogon Kiowa after the Native Americans in that part of the state. So I'm proud of this insect and this little spider, uh, this little jumping spider, Phytopus austinensis is uh, probably the one I see it with the most. To my knowledge, I'm the only person that's ever seen one of these things and I've seen about 20 of them now and always on those same three trees by the tennis courts. I look at other trees down there. I look at trees in Lahana. I can't find them. They're just on these three trees at the community college. But anyway, it's a cool little spider and it's a trick to get spiders. You mix in with the ants and then snag a spider when the spider is not worried about the ants. Uh, here's another little, um, uh, this genus Dipogon means two beards. So those two little they have these two little structures that look like beards. And this is an, a, a related one to the one Dipogon Kiowa. And, uh, and it shows it on Janelle's kitchen uh, light table, uh, approaching this little jumping spider. And then it grabs it by the mouth and drags it, it uh, drags it to a cavity in the wood. and lays an egg on it, and then the baby wasp eats the spider. So spiders as food for birds is something I'm really interested in. And a lot of songbirds probably eat spiders when they come across them. Um, there's a few that I think eat more spiders than most birds, and I think that's the wrens. But uh, some of these birds like creepers and nuthatches and chickadees that we see working along the bark in the winter, they eat a lot of spiders or spider eggs, uh, overwintering spiders under the bark. And then there's a couple birds that in the literature, it's uh, noted that uh, hummingbirds and cedar waxwings will actually uh, regularly, regularly pick insects out of spider webs. They'll stand by the edge of the web and then just uh, wait for things to get caught and then steal it from the spider um, poaching. So here's uh, examples of what some of these little uh, chickadees, nuthatches, and creepers eat. And these three across the top are eggs, moth eggs, spider eggs, praying mantis egg case, and then spiders 
aphids, aphid eggs, uh, pupae of insects, scale insects, and then these pseudoscorpions. But I think spiders, I see a lot of uh, chickadees pulling apart spider uh, webs for the, the, the adult spider that's in there or the eggs. Uh, this is a house wren that uh, routinely brought both spiders and daddy long legs to its babies. And uh, so the baby's sitting there at the nest with its mouth open and uh, mom doesn't prepare it. It just jams that wriggly thing right down the throat and uh, there's no choice involved here. That's sort of what I like about birds. Um, these are uh, all canyon wrens that bring a lot of spiders to their nestlings. This is up at Horse Tooth Reservoir, where I did some stuff with Nate uh, in that warning. And uh, it was a great fun watching all this stuff come in to be fed. And, and you could actually identify a lot of it, but these are all spiders and we did this with rock wrens and the rock wren brought a totally different set of things to its babies even though they were sharing the same general area the nests maybe were 50 yards apart but the house wren was down in the meadow getting moths and caterpillars and soft body things beetles and the wren, the canyon wren was going into these caves and crevices in the rocks and getting centipedes and spiders and crane flies and things that hide in, in dark rocky places. And if you look at their skull, the skull of the canyon wren is much more compressed for going in those uh, cracks and crevices in the rocks than uh, the skull of a rock wren that's more rounded. And they're not squeezing their head into those kind of places. But here's a, a rock wren out at Crow Valley Campground that that got this little uh, jumping spider. So I, I think wrens eat a lot of spiders. Uh, my friends, the loggerhead shrikes, um, they, they definitely uh, get some spiders, uh, big ones, and they probably eat small spiders and just uh, eat them right away and don't uh, impale them or cache them on a fence or a thorn. And I want to talk a little bit about this thing that Rachel uh, Hopper figured out. So here's here's some spiders impaled on barbed wire. And uh, they, they're almost as big as tarantulas, as some of these wolf spiders. And I, I was pretty excited, the first wolf spider I found on a fence post. I've only seen this three or four times. But uh, uh, this kind of illustrates what I've tried to show the shrike classes over the years is that each group of uh, animals that a shrike finds, they got a different way of uh, sticking them on the fence and uh, the art of impaling, as I call it. And they, you got to stick it on there so it stays, but you'd kind of like it to, to be alive when you come back. So how do you stick something on a barbed wire fence to where it doesn't wriggle off, but stays? And it looks like the method of choice with these big spiders is right through the, the underside of the abdomen or the cephalothorax. And I can't believe the spider lives too long with that method, so. But this one down here is actually a nursery web spider, the only non-wolf spider that I've ever found impaled. But I got a feeling if the spider is big enough to impale, it would be impaled. And so the holy grail of, of shriking will be to find, we've already found a rattlesnake. So the next holy grail will be a, a tarantula. Um, but anyway, when you're out there looking at um, barbed wire fences, trying to find things that shrikes have impaled, you notice spiders run the barbed wire fence like the interstate and uh, they hunt the, the barbed wire. And here's a, um, a jumping spider with a, a wasp. And this is a type of fly called a small headed fly. And they are parasites of flies. So what this fly does is lay its eggs in places where they when they hatch, they're likely to encounter spy, uh, spiders. 
because they want their kids to climb up the leg of the spider, burrow into the gut of the spider and feed on it. So uh, here's this barbed wire where spiders are running and here's this barbed wire where shrikes are impaling their larder on the fence. And here's what Rachel found, a lesser earless lizard impaled on the fence, covered with small headed fly eggs. So either they knew spiders are gonna be running along this fence or that ballooning spiders might land on this lump on the barbed wire fence and be a place where their kids might encounter a spider. So I thought that was pretty amazing that this is all an ecosystem. This barbed wire is a big ecosystem, big web of life and all this stuff's going on out there. And then one day I'm out there looking at uh, a, a high rabbit brush on the top of a hill, which is also covered with these uh, small headed fly eggs because I think the small headed fly knows that more Spiders are going to deposit out on the tallest bush on the tallest hill. And here's a spider eating the small headed fly that's trying to lay eggs that will parasitize it. And it's just a big, big bad world out there. Very cool. Um, so here are the major spider families that we have in Colorado jumping spiders, uh, crab spiders, and on down the list. And most of you probably would recognize uh, several of these if you saw them. Uh, orb weavers are probably the most celebrated spiders in this book, Charlotte's Web is talking about this one spider that's back east, uh, Aranius cavaticus. Uh, and uh, one thing that uh, kind of a generality we can make about spiders is the ones that we uh, that have webs and not all spiders uh, weave webs that are designed to catch things. Uh, those spiders usually have poor eyesight. They're relying on their web to find their prey for them. And then they're very sensitive to movements. And so you touch a, a orb weaver's web and I, it'll come running out to see what did that. And But the, the hunting spiders, like the little jumping spiders that don't weave webs to catch their food, they have very good eyesight. And you can have a jumping spider maybe two, three feet away from you and you move and it, it'll turn its head and watch you. So uh, spiders that make webs have poor eyes usually and the ones that hunt without a web have good eyesight. Um, so here's some more drawings uh, by my son, Matt. Uh, in this uh, book that Whitney did uh, that shows the steps of an orb weaver's uh, web. And they kind of start by doing a ballooning type web across from one uh, part of a forked branch to another. And then they walk back on that same line and then they drop down a little bit and keep pulling that down and then they go back up and, and swing via the wind out to make another spoke or jump out there and they start making the spokes on the web and they're walking the outside and doing some similar motion and they eventually get a pretty good network and then they go back to the middle and start doing a spiral outward and then fill in the side uh, branches with more webbing. And again, remember some of these are sticky and some aren't. And so the spider knows how to work, work its way around this thing without getting stuck in its own web. But these little fine ones are sticky. And then uh, Larson understands all this and he's pretty awesome, his cartoons. <laughs> But um, 
So here's a spider that Janelle took in her backyard. This uh, spotted orb weaver, and it's actually a lot of orb weavers make a new web every day. And in order to do that, they consume their old web, recycle the material and lay it back down in, in the new web. And this spider is consuming its web. And she got a lot of awards for this photograph in these uh, county fair contests and so on. And you got to understand if you win a picture in southeastern Colorado in a fair with a picture of a spider, you have, uh, if you go down there and look at those contests, every Every other winner of these contests is a horse or a farm uh, lady on a couch with a cat. Um, and that, that's not a uh, sexist comment, that's the truth. <laughs> and, and she, she, she won the contest with a spider, which I think is probably right up there with the Nobel Prize. Um, um, this is a big black and yellow garden spider that uh, occurred in her backyard. And it became a source of great education. Uh, she has these, uh, this crew of guys that come in her backyard and mow her grass. And they're Hispanics and she taught them all about this spider and they loved this spider and they loved coming to her yard to see the spider and what it was doing and what it had done today and what it had caught. And I really think it was cool and it's what we can all do with kids and anybody uh, with one natural object that we can turn other people onto that if we know a little bit about it. And I think that's the whole purpose of these programs and the purpose of outreach and the purpose of teen naturalist programs is if we can turn people onto this stuff, we don't have to do anything else to sell it, you know, and they'll defend it and they'll love it and they'll share it. And yeah, we get discouraged sometimes about what's going on and that, you know, the car commercials are telling everybody to go tear up the world. You've been cooped up long enough and go charging through a stream and and uh you know i just gotta hope that that's not everybody and that if you could show somebody a water strider that's in that stream or a crayfish or a, maybe they'd go gently through the stream instead of hitting it at 30 miles an hour but um this spider here educated a lot of people and and uh her neighbors and Everybody was coming over, the kids across the street to see what this big female garden spider did. And um, she, this is the male of this same species. And, you know, this would, this, you can see why Audubon, John James Audubon painted pictures and called the, the male and female of the warbler two different species because they look so different. He didn't have a book to go to and I'm sure somebody thought that this was a different spider than that one until they watched a mating. But um, anyway, Janelle, th this spider built a web and then Janelle turned on her back porch light at night when she normally didn't. And that spider built a web that was 30 square feet in size to, to catch all the insects that were coming to that porch light. And it was an amazing, I mean, this web went from the ground up to the gutter and out from the house about four feet to um, a post. And uh, it, it was a trap extraordinaire. But these are two egg sacs. So that is a garden spider egg sac. So this particular female mated with two different males produced these two egg sacs and she chose to put them together. And uh, 
you know, if another male spider came along and saw this, he would go, hmm, I got a chance here. And so this is number three. This is male number three. And she was cool with that up to the point where he touched her gonopore, which is her special place. And she wrapped him up in about 20 seconds and ate him. So his uh, luck ran out. Uh, maybe three is not a charm. And uh, she uh, didn't let on that what was going to happen, but he he didn't do something right. And she uh, ended that deal. Um, here's, here's another orb weaver on her house that got an entire monarch butterfly. Um, this is another big spider that we probably have all seen in late summer, early fall, Araneus gym, gymoides, and this is called the cat face spider. And, and these things get pretty big. They're tan and lumpy, and you see them on your outbuilding, an outhouse, or uh, maybe a fence that's got an overhang. And uh, my buddy Whitney at Cranshaw up at CSU decided uh, a neat idea to raise uh, spider awareness would be to have a cat face spider contest. How big is your cat face spider? And he's uh, 2019, a year before COVID, was his 11th year doing this. And uh, a spider that, that we saw, I saw this spider in Janelle's backyard. And I said, you know, this thing is getting huge. And you ought to think about entering this in Whitney's contest. Her granddaughter, Rhea from Denver, visited a couple times during the summer. And she took a shine to this cat face spider. And they, I don't know if this is kosher or not, but they did. A, admittedly kind of tossed some stuff in the web to help it out a little bit and the spider kept getting bigger and bigger and anyway um i got fearful that this thing was gonna lay an egg mass and lose two-thirds of its size so on one of my return trips from going down there i brought it immediately to the campus at csu ran into whitney's lab and said weigh this weigh this sucker and he waited and it blew away everything that he'd ever seen in 11 years was 25 percent bigger than the second place one the previous biggest one which was i don't know if you guys can you guys see the whole screen um anyway the previous champion was named Iraq obama and um Princess Rhea, named after Rhea, blew away Barack Obama, and it's now the biggest one we know of. So I imagine once uh, COVID goes away, Whitney will resume this contest. So if you learn what a cat face spider is and you see a really big one, um, be aware there is a contest where you can uh, give Miss Rhea, Princess Rhea, a run for her money. But this is Princess Rhea. That is Princess Rhea. It was a big spider. Harmless. Well, I guess it could bite, but Whitney took a chance. And here's Rhea with her trophy. Whitney made up this awesome trophy and did it upright and gave her a uh, big, gave her books, coffee table book, a book. Uh, I think those are paperweights. She even got to raise her own brine shrimp. And I mean, this was the most awesome trophy I've ever seen. Um, so jumping spiders are probably the group that, if any of you think spiders are cute, this is probably the group that you say that about. Uh, they're hunting spiders. Um, they can jump. Uh, several times their body length and probably were the inspiration for that spider that jumps all the way across the room in that goofy movie arachnophobia that sets back all um, environmental education five years every time it shows but um, 
they have great eyesight, two great big eyes, and then some little ones for uh, light and dark, but the two big ones actually uh, have an, an image. And uh, um, if you look up peacock spiders online, you're going to see some amazing uh, mating rituals. It's worth a, uh, going into YouTube to see this peacock spiders. And the most common one we have is this Phytopus audax. This is Phytopus audax, and those are not fangs. Those are the paterons. That's the sheath for the fangs. And the, the, the sheath plus the fang is called the chalicera. And then these are the pedipalps that are kind of outside and help maneuver food into the mouth. There's the big eyes and then the little eyes, three over here and three over here. But here's some more, shows you the variation in color uh, of Phytopus audax. And here on this one, you can actually see the fangs that are sticking out of the paterons. Right down there are the fangs, but these are all the same species. And uh, if you think identifying birds is hard, you ought to get on one of these spider websites and watch these guys argue about the identification of spiders. And, and uh, you know, there's always somebody that knows more than somebody else, and somebody that knows more, and somebody that thinks they know more. And Eventually, there's some silence for a couple of days, and then the dude that knows that group weighs in and says, "You're all wrong. It's this, and it's it's." Uh... So then you just go back to taking pictures of spiders, and you and you don't worry about what species it is because nobody can figure it out but the dude or the dudette. Um, but here's a a jumping spider with a a cucumber beetle that it caught. And I think these photos are awesome that Janelle's able to take on her kitchen counter. And we all let these go in her backyard and, and you would think her whole back of her house would be covered with spider webs and spiders and it's not. They, they disperse, uh, they get preyed upon. She's got bird feeders and birds come to her yard. And so that has only been one year where her house had an exorbitant number of spider webs on the back. It's brick. So here's a Phytopus with a very uh, variable fritil uh, variable fritillary, and that's a pretty big prey item for a little spider. But they don't do anything except take the juice out of the body. They don't worry about the wings. Uh, here's a Phytopus cardinalis, a magnificent creature. I've always said if insects and spiders were the size of Volkswagens, people would pay money to go see them. And the problem with these things, there's too little. But uh, if we can get down there and these cameras that we can all buy nowadays that have those macro features and so on, we can start seeing this stuff the way, the way it really uh, stands out and, and see it in its true glory. I mean, these things are magnificent. Here's a little uh, Phytopus male, uh, Carolin Carolinensis male with his little screech owl tufts and big pedipalps. So if you see a spider with very enlarged pedipalps, it's probably a male because that's the, the sperm delivery is done with those. Um, you've seen these orange ones. You've probably seen orange jumping spiders and maybe Apache anus. There's a couple other ones. Uh, this is my favorite Far Side cartoon. Do um, you remember the little chubby kid that climbs up the ladder? He's climbing up the ladder and these spiders are talking. Um, so here's one that pulled it off. Um, how in the world did that spider subdue that grasshopper? But he did. And, um, you know, you, you see these stories about praying mantises that catch hummingbirds and, you know, size is not to be underestimated. Uh, these are uh, in the genus Habernatus and Janelle took these, got these on the wall in a, in a little pocket park they built in downtown Lamar. And this is the one that I think my 
Dipogon Kiowa uh, wasp likes the most this little jumping spider. There's a jumping spider with a little longer abdomen. It's in a different group of jumping spiders. And then these beautiful little green ones. Uh, you've probably all seen these on a, a night where it was cool and the dew formed and you go out in the grass and you see these little patches of uh, looks like diamonds uh, on the vegetation on the grass and that's there's a spider web that's holding all those webs all those uh, dew drops and these are the the sheet web weavers and they're quite common in your bushes and junipers and shrubs and and on the grass and th these are the ones that probably do the most uh, ballooning if we ever go out in the fall and we're aware of a lot of spiders are going through the air it's probably these um, and and then this is another uh, circle that you see down a lot of times in the grass and it's a, a web a funnel and these are the funnel weavers the agen agilinity and um or grass spiders is another name for them and uh here's the cemetery headstone at grandview where i go all the time and we've got one uh, creature laid to rest and here's another one laying in wait on the headstone with this web that goes into the, apparently this top is not real tight with the bottom part of this headstone. And he's got a, a or it maybe goes back into this rose bush, but um, anyway, he's waiting and there's the, and he's got this grasshopper that was unaware and wandered into that web. So funnel web weaver. Then uh, crab spiders is another one we probably all see. And some of these spiders are amazing in that they're like chameleons and they can actually change their color to match the background. And this real common one in um, Misumenops is real common on roses. And it, they actually can get kind of pinkish. You'll see them on a yellowish flower and they get light yellow and uh, real common, but great big front legs that they hold out wide and just wait for something to come to the flower and then they pounce on them. Here's a fly that came to a flower and met its demise. And a little bee. Here's a crab spider with a beautiful uh, fruit fly or fruit fly. And um, this is a common one. And you can see the eye arrangement on this is different than those crab spiders. The two biggest eyes are not quite as big. And then they got these two little eyes in between and then some more back up in here, one there and one there, and another one over here and over here. So these eye arrangements are important. But these Zystichus uh, genus, Zystichus of the crab spiders are pretty common. Uh, this is a lynx spider, and you can see its eye arrangement is different yet with the big ones up above, two little ones, and then some other ones on the side over here that you can't see very well, one up there. And if you see one of these great big spiders on a rock in the river, it could be a wolf spider, but it's probably one of these fishing spiders in this family Pissaridae. And that's a face only a mother would love. Uh, looks like um, Sasquatch or something, but um, big, big spiders, you know, maybe four, four inches across, five inches across sometimes. Very big on rocks, big boulders in the river, usually running water place. And they they will catch small fish uh, and other insects like water striders, maybe water beetles. Uh, some of these spiders uh, mimic ants, like the pompilla that I showed you, the spider wasp. And this is a great example of a uh, a spider wasp or a, of a 
a, a spider that's an ant mimic and quite colorful. Uh, here are the wolf spiders. Probably most of the spiders we see are the ones that catch our eye in our house and scare us in the basement or when we're out raking the leaves or whatever are wolf spiders. And some of them are pretty large to the point where I don't know, over the years, I probably got a hundred of these sent to me thinking they were tarantulas. And uh, to our knowledge, we don't have tarantulas north of, uh, much north of I-70 on the plains, or uh, we have three species probably, uh, it's up to debate, but uh, we have one around Canyon City, then one over on the West Slope, and then one on the Southeastern Plains. And uh, these spiders are almost that big, these wolf spiders. But they've got um, uh, eight, eight eyes in the front, and the, they're pretty easy to identify by looking at this eye uh, structure, four and four. Uh, unequal size, two rows. But pretty big fangs or patterns with fangs inside of there. And here's a, a spider wasp hauling off a wolf spider that it found. This was down by Kim. I think I saw this one down by Kim on the Comanche grasslands. And it, the spider's not dead, it's stunned. And they bury them alive, then lay eggs on them. So the, the young wasps, uh, the, the larval wasps are feeding on live uh, fresh food. Um, but then we have the, we do have tarantulas and it took me a long time before I picked one of these up, even though Whitney said they, they're very tame, they're very tame, they're very tame. It's like, yeah, but man, that's hard to do to go out and just pick one of these up. And I've done it now a lot. And um, I took one of these to the state fair, to a booth we had at the state fair and we had over 300 people handle this one spider that we named Fowler because he was found near the town of Fowler. And uh, we didn't have any incident. Nobody uh, got bit and it became kind of like spider therapy for a lot of people. And you could see people that have had problems with spiders or, or tarantulas specifically for a long time. And they see some little eight-year-old girl holding the spider and giggling and here's some tough old rancher that has been probably killing him his whole life and the little girl walks up and says you want to hold it and what's this guy going to say and so hopefully we've cured some people of their fear of spiders this way but there was one kid that came up and he wanted me to get over his let him get over his fear and put it on his arm and he was shaking like a leaf and I actually put it on his hand, he had his hand open, and I put it on his hand, and he immediately squeezed down on it, and I thought, oh, here we go, I'm going to get sued, and he opened his hand up, and the spider crawled up his arm and did not bite him, and I'm like, if that spider didn't bite him, then I guess these things are really super tame, and um, the ones we see out and about are the males, and they're probably close to 10 years old when they actually venture out for the first time and look for a, a female. And so they cruise around, they're not migrating like the TV stations say every year, they're just out cruising around and probably a male doesn't go more than a hundred yards or maybe a couple hundred yards in its life looking for a female. And it investigates the openings of the, the ground tunnels and if his luck is in the air, she comes out and accepts him and they mate. Um, but if he doesn't find a mate before cold weather happens, uh, he's dead. So it's basically eight to 10 years of growing and developing before he gets his big fall to go out and try to mate. And uh, he's either successful or not, but uh, um, this was a bicycle race they had in southeastern Colorado two springs ago, or two falls ago, called Pedal the Plains, and they 
anticipated that they would see tarantulas because that's the time of year when the spiders do come out and the tarantulas are seen on the roads. And so they had a spider on their official race shirt for that year. And as luck would have it, hardly anybody saw one. But they called CSU to see that this is sponsored by Nine News in Denver and uh, or the Denver Post and they they called CSU and they wanted somebody to be at one of their water stops with a tarantula to show the the bikers while they were resting and drinking water to just bone them up a little bit on the tarantulas that they had been seeing well as it turned out uh, my buddy Whitney couldn't go and I was going to go visit Janelle so I said I would go and uh, he gave me a tarantula to take down for show and tell and most of the riders had not seen a single one on their ride and so they were thrilled to actually see one and they got to hold it and put it on their face and put it on their helmet and do selfies and it. they totally exploited this poor uh, Oklahoma brown tarantula which we nicknamed Merle for Merle Haggard up here it looks kind of like a jumping spider but um, Anyway, th this was a tarantula brown that got totally abused. And by the end of uh, 50 or 75 bikers uh, doing selfies with him, he actually got very tired. And we had to just say, nobody, you know, we're, we're just going to show it to you, but we can't do this, um, putting them on your face and everything. And uh, uh, he kind of rested up and we gave him some water and we let him go at the end of this session and he immediately began, began crawling west from Lamar back to where he was caught which was on uh, route 109 going from Lamar or from Lahana down to Kim and he, he you know we turned him around he would always turn back and go west like he knew where he came from and where he wanted to go so hopefully Merle made it but He's the most celebrated uh, spider, at least among bikers in the history of Colorado. Um, but here's these, these big tarantula hawks and uh, uh, they're quite, quite a big spider and they usually win these contests with the spider, with the tarantulas. Um, so a lot of questions from the public about spiders in, home, in homes and the, this, famous line that you're never probably 10 feet from a spider in your house is probably true. And it's a lot of the, um, uh, the weaver spiders, the cobweb weavers like they include this black widow is, that's probably the most common arthropod in the world uh, are, are these sh sheet web weavers. Um, you know, on the whole, they're certainly beneficial on, on the, you know, the grand scheme, they're very beneficial and there's just occasional problems that have created all this fear amongst humans, but um, uh, not very many can actually breed in your house. Um, black widows are very common and I bet we could find one and almost everybody that's signed on for this session today, I bet we could go find one in your house or your garage or your uh, storage shed. Brown recluse is probably the most misunderstood spider and we'll talk about that a little bit, but these are the ones that since this is being uh, uh, put online so you could see this later, I'm not gonna go through all this, but these are the ones that are probably the most common inside your house uh, groups. Um, so here's one of these. Um, that you commonly see that uh, I don't, for some reason, I don't particularly like these spiders. They give me the creeps, I got to admit it. But um, this is one you may have seen uh, under a rock or, and they are the roly poly hunters, uh, pill bug hunters. And they have this beautiful maroon, tan and golden yellow color scheme. And I think a football team ought to adapt that color scheme, but uh, these are roly-poly hunters and they've got some tremendous fangs for breaking through that exoskeleton of the isopods. Um, black widows are very common. They're not aggressive. Their toxin is very toxic, maybe 15 times out of a rattlesnake, uh, our prairie rattlesnake. And um, it's a neurotoxin that they have as opposed to uh, 
the brown recluse, which is a tissue dissolver. Uh, this one affects, the black widow affects your nervous system. And um, that's the female that has that famous uh, black bulbous abdomen with the red hourglass. And um, the black, the, the brown recluse is uh, greatly exaggerated, greatly misdiagnosed by medical doctors. And probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, you could say that there were only about five legitimate cases of brown recluse in Colorado. As a lot of things are moving, Southern things are coming north and uh, Southern Eastern things are coming a little bit west as we get more humid with lawn watering and so on. Uh, we're seeing more brown recluses in Colorado, especially southeastern Colorado. And it used to be the ones that we did have that were legitimate were probably came in on, um, you know, the soldiers coming to Fort Carson that were recently assigned somewhere else back east in Kansas or Texas or somewhere. And um, maybe college students bringing them in or other people that have moved around the country. But now I think we're starting to see them. And this is uh, Janelle's storage shed, remote storage shed down in Lamar. And she's seen several of them in there. <laughs> and she's told the owner of the storage business that he's got an infestation and he poo-poos the whole thing and hasn't done anything and, and has refused to to clean it up and I think he's probably going to have a problem at some point but um, but this is a brown recluse that Janelle got out of her storage shed and the famous ID is that this marking on the top of the cephalothorax looks like a violin if you use your imagination I guess it does but uh, there's other spiders that kind of have that marking and we have some other recluse spiders in the state that aren't as dangerous as the brown recluse. So if you have a spider that you think is one of these, I would say collect it and uh, put it in ethanol or isopropyl if that's what you have and send it to Paula Cushing at the Denver Museum for identification. Um, and here's general information on treating spider bites. And um, uh, realize that, that your family doctor is not probably really up to snuff on diagnosing these things. And um, they're grossly, you know, a skin problem or a plant a thorn, a prick on a thorn, or a lot of things are mistaken for spider bites and, and allergic reactions to food and, and spider bites, spiders get a bad rap for a lot of things that aren't spider bites. But anyway, here's Paula, the, the, uh, the expert in Colorado on spiders. And she's got a huge collection down there, 40,000 vials full of spiders and most of them are cataloged. And uh, you can contact her at the museum. She has a neat little newsletter called the Rechnophile. And uh, she's the head of the, the Colorado Spider Survey, which is badly needed. And uh, so she's a great resource that we have in Colorado. I, uh, this is not a knock on Paula. She's just very busy. So if you send her something, don't expect she's going to answer in five minutes. But um, uh, somebody, she's got an army of volunteers and people helping her. So. Uh, I would encourage you to collect spiders and send them to her for ID and, and uh, maybe participate in her newsletter and maybe even get involved in the survey. She teaches wonderful classes in spiders. And, uh, if you really want to learn spider ID, that's what you need to do. And it's a multi-hour thing and it's, it's excellent. Um, and here are just some uh, common reference references. And uh, we still don't have a great uh, um, field guide to spiders like Sibley for birds or the National Geographic field guide for birds. We still don't have one of those. And 
Uh, this little Spiders in Their Kin, which is a golden guide, is still a great little book to get if you can find it. Uh, Barnes and Noble or somebody, uh, maybe Amazon, you can buy this book. But that's a great, if you want to get one little book on spiders, that's a great one to get. And uh, most of those golden guides aren't, aren't the best thing you could buy nowadays, but Spiders in Their Kin is a great one. And then this this is more of a, a coffee table book with big paintings, but there's this thing called the Kansas School Naturalist, which is a great little series out of Emporia State, and they've got some cool little booklets on jumping spiders and cobweb weavers and some of the other ones. So, but uh, anyway, and then there's lots of information available at CSU through their Cooperative Extension fact sheets. So. You should be able to answer these questions. Is the spider an insect? I should, I'm hearing this screaming outside. No. Is the daddy long legs a spider and are they dangerous? No, no. <laughs> Colorado tarantula is dangerous. Probably not. No. Uh, do spiders fly across the room? No. no. <laughs> What's a camel spider? And are the ones in the Middle East over a foot long? They're yeah. not a foot long. The camel spider is a sulpugid or a, a sun spider is another name for it. But brown recluse in Colorado, yes, but only in Southeast Colorado, very rare and maybe brought into other parts of the state by humans. And how close are you to a spider right now? At least 10 feet. So anyway, there's Janelle photographing her mama garden spider. And um, and here are the people that I thank for this presentation, and uh, especially uh, Carol here and uh, the people on the Boulder Audubon who have got us through this uh, virgin attempt at Zoom, and we did it, I guess. And uh, uh, anyway, so thank you for Zooming in tonight. And I guess now we'll do the question and answer I would probably yeah. way over time but uh well that's okay David thank you very very much and thanks to Janil for all the amazing photographs yeah. um, as far as questions go if you have a question for David let's type it into the chat so that we don't have a lot of people talking over one another trying to unmute while you guys are doing that I made a, a couple of copies of some of the questions I got asked during the course of the you talked about the cat face spider, David. How does one go about weighing a spider? <laughs> uh, Whitney's got a, he had a scale in, a, in his lab that I think is used for measuring chemicals and small amounts of things. And so it's a, you know, a, a very fine uh, scale, uh, uh, basically a chemistry scale. And uh, he put it on there and it definitely, uh, rang the bell. <laughs> I mean, he about he about fell over when he saw the weight. I mean, I I wish I'd had a video of him when he put it on there because he could not believe that spider how much it weighed. And uh, he actually uh, kept it and let it go in his backyard to improve the gene pool in Fort Collins. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, that spider hopefully uh, passed on its uh, genes to, to, to the Northern Front Range from Southeast Colorado. Um, earlier, we had a question, do spiders eat miller moths? Yes, yes, they do. Uh, not enough, but they, they eat them. And uh, uh, like a lot of animals that catch moths, their, their biggest problem is getting rid of the wings and all those scales. And um, so you saw that one spider with the uh, variable fritillary. And uh, so they'll, they'll not cut the wings off like birds do, but they'll, they'll just deal with the body. And then when that web comes down, the, the kind of the leftovers go with it and they start all over again with a new web. So yeah, they do eat millers, but uh, the millers are kind of on the move when we see them. They're m migrating from the plains uh, where they were they were uh, cutworms out there, probably eating wheat, and then they migrate to the high mountain meadows to spend the summer up in the mountain on the flowers, and uh, uh, then they migrate back in the fall. And 
so they're on the move. They they linger on the front range longer than I think they used to because of all the things we plant, and they almost get uh, thinking, well, maybe I don't need to go to the mountains. There's plenty of flowers down here, and I think we do have some that maybe some are at the lower elevations now, but most of them still go to the mountains. And uh, uh, what I noticed this year with our weather was that I think the reverse migration of millers was a lot more prominent than I usually, you usually don't notice them that much in the fall, and I did this year. And I think it was because of that big cold snap we had in September, it kind of flushed a lot of them out of the mountains all at once. And uh, hopefully the spiders were getting a few of them anyway. Okay. Ann Cooper uh, said that you had mentioned earlier that spiders are not really, spiders are not really water dwellers, but lots of them seem to crawl around on algae mats. Do any spiders go underwater at all? Um, I, I don't know of any that do, although I think, you know, some beetles can uh, carry a, a, an air bubble with them and, and live on that air bubble without coming to the surface. But I have never heard of spiders doing that. I think they do hunt on the surface of water, but going underwater, no, I don't think they do that. <clears throat> Jamie Olden is mentioning diving bell spiders. Maybe well, that's, that's the one I think that uses uh, the air bubble. And, yeah. but, we, but we don't have them here, I don't okay. think. Okay. Um, All right. I've got maybe two questions uh, left here before we wrap things up. One is uh, out in Bellevue, there are a lot, somebody's noted here that they have tons of giant wolf spiders. They live in these big, deep, extensive holes. Do they dig those themselves or are they stealing them from other insects? Uh, I think wolf spiders take over uh, tunnels that a lot of other things, oh, what did I do? Wolf spiders take over tunnels that other creatures have made, and they probably do some excavating of their own, but uh, I think most of the time they're taking over other stuff, um, usurping the tunnels of other creatures. All they, right. And they'll lie, I mean, they modify these structures, whether they made it or not, and it, I, I think it depends. There's probably both schemes uh, going on, but of course, they line whatever it is they they make or they take over with silk and and modify it into their own structure. And then our last question, Dave, is who is this uh, who is the spider that's on your your thank you slide? That is a zystichus, which is a a crab spider. Uh, um, he's uh, He's got his legs kind of propped up out on the side and you can't see why he's lifting up like that. But that, that's a big crab spider in the uh, part of the leg that's shown is probably one fifth of the leg length. And, uh, but he's, a, he's a, a, a happy crab spider. All right. Well, um, thank you. Some of our um, attendees tonight who have seen your presentations in the past and spent time with you. We're glad that you made it back to Shrikes. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't disappoint in that regard. We, okay, we yeah, very yeah. much appreciate you making it back to that. For yeah. those of you who are still with us, uh, we will get this on our YouTube channel. And if you head to our website, Boulder County Audubon Society website, uh, you should be able to get a link to our YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, in the meantime, David, thank you very much. Okay. Our thank November you. presentation will be again on a fourth Tuesday, 7.15, and that will be Scott Rashid talking about uh, kestrels and some of the work he's done with those birds. But David, thank you very much. This was okay. a, a great a great presentation. Thank you. And uh, we really appreciate your time. And, All right. And uh, thanks a lot. Thank, and, thank you for uh, being gentle. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It was uh, very informative. We all appreciate it. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. And thank you for attending tonight. Um, we'll see you in a month. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Bye.